When you think of cricket, what memories, matches, or moments of the professional game come to mind? A lot of you probably think of stuff like this. Wow. The lion roars, and what a way to bring up this century! Oh, well, close. He's given it He's given it It goes as far as the fence. India, incredible! On the other hand, a lot of you maybe think about this. What shot that is! Again, it's smashed away! Pull out the book he has! He's done it for a third time! This ball. Pen! Oh! Enormous hit! That's gone. It's taken time, but slowly and surely, 2020 cricket leagues, in particular the IPL, have taken over the cricket landscape as the most profitable and popular version of cricket. And as it continues its stark rise, the beloved test cricket is slowly feeling the pinch. This year's edition of the IPL is in my opinion, the best season the competition has ever had. Almost every single match has had iconic moments happening. Rinku Singh's incredible effort to hit five consecutive sixes for KKR, Rashid Khan's hat-trick, Shubman Gill's knocks, or Virat Kohli's back-to-back -back centuries. These moments, among the countless others, have been historic and incredible to watch, making this IPL so fascinating. I for one have always had a love-hate relationship with the IPL, and I still do, more on that later. But this season is the first one where I've attempted to engage with the tournament on a deeper level than I usually would, and I have not regretted it. The statistics also support why this is the best tournament yet. It has had more sixes than any of the previous editions, there have been more chases over 200, more fans attending the games, and furthermore, the broadcast deal continues to skyrocket. This tournament feels like it has reached the point where it is finally on par with the big US leagues like the NBA or the NFL. It is that popular. So obviously this is great for cricket, right? Well, it's complicated. The IPL is great for cricket, but mostly T20 and Indian cricket. The competition generates so much money for the BCCI while also allowing them to expose their up and coming players to the best the world has to offer. The tournament is also great for T20 cricket specialists who have perfected the art of micromanaging their games to maximise their 30 balls faced or 4 overs bowled. However, what about these guys? Where do they fit in in the ever-changing cricket landscape? It's very easy to make the boring old case that test cricket nuffies always make about the IPL destroying cricket altogether. And while that argument is stupid and unfair, there is evidence justifying the negative impacts the IPL has had on the longest form of the game. I've looked to summarise how the IPL has negatively impacted test cricket throughout this video. For a substantial amount of time in cricket's history, cricket boards have long desired to be granted the opportunity to play test cricket or attain full member status. This would mean that the ICC grants teams the licence to play test match cricket. Currently, there are only 12 test playing nations with the most recent teams to join being Afghanistan and Ireland in 2018. Just 12 teams playing cricket's premier format. Playing test cricket for a long time was seen as the be all and end all for the associate nations. Players from teams like Ireland and Afghanistan dreamed of one day getting to go up against the best teams in the world and prove their mettle as cricketers. But upon joining the test cricket landscape, they found out, like some before them, that it isn't as simple as that. You see, unlike other international competitions, such as the FIFA World Cup or the Six Nations in Rugby, competition against the other nations isn't mandatory. As a result, to play against the best teams in the world, the tours have to be organised between cricketing boards. And in a sport where money is everything, many of the large cricketing nations have decided to play more tests against each other than to give the time of day to the developing countries as these matches don't make anywhere near as much money. This therefore means that countries such as Ireland and Afghanistan don't have the chances to improve their test cricket. This is the number of test matches played by the top five test nations against Ireland and Afghanistan since they joined test cricket in 2018. Two test matches in five years. Furthermore, Ireland and Afghanistan have played just six test matches each since becoming full members. Just six. And hardly any of them are against the very best teams in the world. How are these teams meant to improve if they can't play the very best the world has to offer? 
So if you are in these countries' boots, what are you supposed to do? Continue to play about one test match a year with little to no chance of seeing any improvement? Or perhaps turn your eyes to the more lucrative, expanding format which is dominating world cricket? That's exactly what these teams have done. As a result of barely playing any test cricket, players such as Rashid Khan, Naveen Al Haq, Josh Little and many more have focused their energy on becoming the best short form players they can possibly be. And that is proving most fruitful for them, as these players are starting to become key in their respective T20 franchises, especially in the IPL. Take Josh Little for example, who recently decided not to play in Ireland's test against England at Lords, instead choosing to rest up after his season in the IPL. Why would it make sense for him, a professional athlete, to focus his skills for a format which for his country has no foreseeable future and reason to get better, when instead he could be making loads of money, playing in the IPL and doing a quarter of the job? Even the Ireland director of cricket agreed with the decision, saying that the Lord's Test match isn't the pinnacle event for the country's cricket team. And this change in mentality is beneficial to the smaller teams as well. The beauty of T20 cricket is that its volatile nature evens the playing field between two teams. Over the course of four innings, of course Australia will overpower a team like Afghanistan. However, in just 20 overs, like we saw in the last World Cup, the margin becomes far thinner. T20 cricket is more accessible and winnable for these smaller nations, and unlike the big countries, they just don't have the resources to focus their energy into three formats. As a result, the format that appeals to them the most is obviously T20 cricket. Even one day is are bordering on pointless for the majority of these teams now, as the World Cup is now home to just 10 nations. Let me repeat that. The official World Cup of cricket, World Cup, has just 10 teams in it. This is another reason why the traditional formats of cricket are just dipping in popularity, as they just aren't as desirable for these countries' players anymore. And while a negative for Test cricket, it is a major plus for the IPL, which now sees vastly more quality players electing to play in India as opposed to on the international stage. The IPL's expansion into other countries has also had a negative impact on Test cricket. The SA20, for example, is South Africa's 2020 competition. However, instead of playing teams supported by South Africa, all of the franchises are owned by the big money IPL owners. For example, MI Cape Town are owned obviously by Mumbai Indians. This impact is not limited to South Africa, however, as teams owned by IPL franchises are all over the world in places such as the West Indies, the UAE, and even in the upcoming USA competition. The IPL has identified that these weaker cricketing nations rely heavily on their T20 competitions and as a result, by supporting them financially through linking multiple franchises, it has a ripple effect in strengthening the competitions and its fan base. For example, if you are, say, a KKR fan, you would likely follow and support their CPL equivalent. This entrepreneurship from the IPL is vastly positive for these nations who can't rely on test match cricket to generate revenue. The impact of this is also a negative because it means much less incentive for nations to play test cricket. For example, the CSA in South Africa have identified that short form cricket is what is making them the majority of their earnings. As a result, they are now playing far less test matches and are struggling massively in the format. A number of their star players such as Quinton de Kock have let go of the test format in its entirety, choosing to play just white ball cricket. The same could be said for Faf Duplessis, who has retired from South African cricket altogether, but is still one of the IPL's leading run scorers. This is a massive issue in terms of the future of Test Match cricket, as many teams, particularly the ones aside from Australia and England, no longer see Test cricket as the future of the sport. And with the IPL franchises owning multiple teams, the new future could be that players opt to represent their franchises year-round across the world. Jofra Archer was recently speculated to have been offered a contract where he would play for Mumbai across all of their T20 teams, only playing for England when permission was granted. For Test cricket purists, that must be extremely concerning to hear. For a player like Jofra, there would be so much upside to the contract as well. He would be financially secure for the rest of his life and would only have to bowl four overs a match for the rest of his career instead of damaging his already injury-prone body playing Test matches. Players and organisers are already having to make tough choices given the nature of the schedule. With the IPL being so strict in its scheduling, there is virtually no other professional cricket played while the format is on, aside from Pakistan matches for, you know, political reasons. This means it is becoming increasingly tough for tours to be scheduled. 
Australia's upcoming tour of England, including the World Test Championship final, will feature no warm-up matches whatsoever. This is largely because the players don't have the time for it anymore, since they are playing so often. Players like Josh Hazelwood, Cameron Green and David Warner have to finish their IPL commitments before being able to join the Australians in preparations for the Ashes. So there's no doubt that heading into the tour, they will be somewhat underdone. In fact, Australia is the country in the biggest state of flux due to the IPL's rapid rise. Despite having some of the best white ball players in the world, the Australian community still has a weird resentment towards T20 cricket. It's still seen as a Mickey Mouse hit and giggle game, with the nation still preferring the test format. As a result, the majority of Australian fans have disdain for the IPL and T20s in general, and what they are doing to cricket. Some are even dreading that the test summer may one day be in serious danger. Hell, what if they were to move the Boxing Day test match? The state of the BBL as well doesn't help this. For some time, the Big Bash was seen as the competition that is second to that of the IPL. Not as good, but the next best thing. But as the IPL has expanded into these other competitions, their competitions have improved, while the Big Bash has steadily declined in not only quality of competition, but also popularity, as less big name players are choosing to join in, instead of aligning themselves with the IPL owned franchises overseas. So in conclusion, is the IPL changing cricket for the worse? For a long time, I held the same view as many in Australia. That being that the IPL is a danger to the cricket that I love and grew up with. I always believed that the IPL would continue to spike in popularity, but not to the extent of the test format. However, the day has arrived where the IPL is now the most profitable and most important cricket competition in the world. This season, I have had a change in mindset, and instead am choosing to look at what the IPL has done for cricket as a whole, instead of the damage it has done to the test format. The IPL has made cricket the mainstream commercial sport which it was trying to break into for such a long time. It has put more eyes on the sport than before, generated more revenue, and has found a way so that the very best players in the world could all play at the same time every single year. In 1939, timeless tests were played in cricket. They went until a result was possible. The last timeless test went for so long that the game had to be declared a draw as England had to leave on their boat for back home. It was decided after that that five day test matches had to be mandatory to ensure this wouldn't happen again. My point here is that test cricket has had a number of challenges, it has had to work its way through, and it has always found a way to the other side. The format has been reported to have been dying multiple times, and it is still here. Test cricket is still finding a ways to evolve as a product and it will continue to do so into the future. The IPL is the future of cricket, and it has had a negative impact on the format. But instead of holding anger and resentment against the IPL, I think it's time that Test Cricket does its best to work with it and look at how the competition can help the format. Look at what England is doing with baseball, for instance. The IPL has played a role in that. England's speciality is white ball cricket, and the number of their starting 11 in Test are also superb T20 players. McCullum understood this and embraced it, coaching in a way that allowed the English players to bat in a T20 style of way. I don't think it's unrealistic to say that in 10 years time, all of Test Cricket could be played like that, which could then potentially draw more viewers who prefer the T20 format. My love for cricket is not limited to the Test Match format. Is it the pinnacle? Yes. In my opinion, it is clearly the toughest, most brutal form of the game, and the most entertaining. But I, along with many others, are learning to embrace the IPL for all of the great positives it has done for cricket, as opposed to the negatives. For Test Match Cricket to prosper into the future, maybe it needs to take the same route in working with the tide of T20 cricket instead of against it.